Um, can I now introduce our panel? Um, and we have a very distinguished panel. Um, uh, uh, well, yes. Um, very distinguished. <laughs> I was trying. I was trying to work the gender issue in again, but I decided that was probably a bridge too far, so I've left it at that. Can I? <laughs> uh, so can I introduce the panel? It represents all four countries that make up the NHS, because uh, we're all part of the NHS, even if we have very different systems. But we also have representatives from colleges and from our own faculty. So if I can first of all introduce Jason Leach, who is Director of Quality for NHS Scotland and a member of the Management Board. Can I introduce Sir Bruce Keogh, Professor Sir Bruce Keogh, um, and when I think we come to write the history of this year and people are looking back about the things that made a difference, I personally feel that the Francis report, because of its complexity and it met very many confused messages, will not be the seminal documents, but I think the Keogh reviews will be, because they set the tone in a much more manageable way that made people feel they could do something about it rather than just deal in a morass. We've got Ian Ritchie from uh, President of the Royal College of Surgeons, who's come particularly to be hugged um, today, uh, but can represent uh, the colleges and their view. We have Paddy uh, Woods from uh, Northern Ireland, who is a Deputy Chief Medical Officer, and Chris Woods, who is, um, uh, uh, Chris Jones, sorry, <laughs> who is also a Deputy Chief Medical Officer in Wales. And of course, at the end, our own, our very own Peter Lees. So they're going to hand the baton on neatly, one after the other, and then we'll come back and have the questions at the end of their um, mini presentations. So, Jason, over to you. Um, from Scotland, starting first. Thank you very much. Th welcome, everybody. I know it's the end, and uh, I'm sorry I haven't been here. I've been next door. I was here briefly yesterday, but next door is the International Society for Healthcare Quality. 1,500 people from 73 countries or 76 countries, depending on how you wish to count them. <laughs> Let me just give that a moment to sink in. <laughs> uh, I'm the o I think I'm the only one who's going to stand up, because they asked me, because of that you're in Scotland, just to do a little five-minute introduction with a couple of slides about Scotland's approach to healthcare quality. I'm going to do that very briefly, and then I'm very willing to take questions along with everybody else. I had the privilege of sitting on an NHS England review and that was the Berwick review after the Francis Inquiry. Don, who I worked with for some time when I was in America, asked me to be part of this review group. I was a minority. I'm a fat Scottish dentist. I'm a minority in most rooms. So the, it was a real privilege to be part of this, to report to Bruce and to others. And I thought it was interesting just to show you one slide, one slide of what we considered the solutions to this systemic challenge of quality and safety across the world. This is not a Mid-Staffordshire problem. Mid-Staffordshire was a perfect storm, but it's everywhere. You know it's everywhere, I know it's everywhere. It's in all four countries, it's in all healthcare systems in the world. And if you walked next door, you would discover that it's in the 73 countries who are represented next door as well, and they are enthusiastic and optimistic about trying to fix it. This room is responsible for all four of these elements, but number three, is probably the most important for the purposes of this conversation, and that's about fostering staff development and growth. So number one, put patient safety first. It trumps everything. Number two, engage and empower patients, include them at every level. Number three, foster and develop the staff. And then number four, most controversially of all, and straight to Bruce's heart, is open the doors, shine a light, be transparent at all costs. So what does that look like in Scotland? Well, it doesn't look like this. We used to have 223 targets in Scotland. Now we have 13. That's a revolutionary change in the way we deliver our healthcare system. This is the quality strategy written in 2010, and it's still the single policy document for healthcare quality in Scotland. You won't appreciate how difficult it is unless you've worked in government to keep a policy document for three years. That's almost impossible, but we've managed to keep it up to this point. Following that, we've had more recently in our change of health minister, the 2020 vision, safe, effective, person-centered care, which supports people to live as long as possible at home or in a homely setting. And then to apply it to this world, we've now started to talk about our workforce vision, not our medical workforce vision, our workforce vision. 153,000 people work in the health service in Scotland. 
132,000 whole-time equivalents, 153,000 single individuals just in the healthcare system, not in our social care system, which we are integrating, a bill going through our parliament to integrate health and social care. And we discussed this vision with 10,000 of Scotland's workers, doctors, nurses, porters, managers, all the way through the system. And we came up with a shared set of values that won't look different in any of the four countries, in fact, and I hope they resonate with some of your learning and teaching that you've done over the last few days. Care and compassion, dignity and respect, openness again and transparency, and quality and teamwork. This is nobody's model other than mine around what that leadership might look like. I don't think it's a medical leadership job. I think it's a leadership job. It's partly a medical leadership job, and you have to step up to that particular plate, as many of you are willing and able to do. It's about your value system. It's about you role modeling for those above you and below you and beside you. It is not, role modeling is not a senior job, it's everybody's job. Number three is about the formal reinforcement mechanisms, and that may be where some of the questions take us around terms and conditions, around promotion opportunities, around job planning, around opportunities for this to represent a piece of your puzzle. And we heard that from the trainee who spoke around recognition of her time inside the medical director of England's piece of the puzzle to represent her leadership. I did lean over to Sir Bruce and say if she'd worked for us, we would have represented, we would have used it. But if she, she chose to work in Bruce's office, that was her mistake. <laughs> uh, and number four, the skills and capabilities. So this faculty is all about generating those skills and capabilities, and you've spent a bit of time thinking about what the education elements and the development opportunities might be. And let me finish with this. Genghis Khan. It's not often I quote Genghis Khan. And I'm not sure Genghis Khan actually, there was anybody following him with pieces of paper. So I'm not sure any Genghis Khan quote is actually really Genghis Khan, but it suits my purpose. He says, conquering the world on horseback is easy. It is dismounting and governing that is hard. Leadership and management is meant to be hard. It is not the same as the other things you learned. It's more difficult. That's why it feels uncomfortable sometimes. That's why it feels challenging. Actually running these big systems is really difficult. And I hope you want to play your part in doing exactly that. Thank you for your time. I think what's quite interesting at the moment is there is an enormous natural experiment going on within the NHS in the United Kingdom in that we have four different systems. And uh, I'm not sure if it's been published yet, but I was talking to Chris Ham yesterday and there is emerging evidence that some of the things that are proving so intractable to deal with are actually being tackled in Scotland in a way that the other three countries are not seeing. So I think it's something to do to watch the space of the learning that will come out of Scotland. Now, the others haven't been asked to do anything as formal as that, but what I'd really like now, is starting with Bruce, is the informal sort of reaction to what people have heard, and also the opportunity to say anything they're really keen to say. So, Bruce. Thanks. <coughs> Thanks very much. I mean, my opening remarks are that after so f such a short period of time, it gives me great pleasure to see this faculty progressing in the way that it has. It was born out of adversity when the British Association of Medical Managers ran into some difficulty. And one of the issues that it seeked to address was that it would encompass um, all doctors working in the NHS and would provide a, um, an open door for those that wanted to learn about leadership and management. And I use the terms leadership and management very specifically because I think it's quite easy in a group like this to start thinking that they're synonymous. They overlap, but leaders like um, good generals are able to inspire people often to do things which they might not have thought were a good idea the first time round. And in medicine, uh, there are different levels of leadership. The single and most important level of leadership is is providing a good clinical service. So we all admire and seek to follow those clinicians who we encountered during the course of our training who are just fine doctors. And we must never forget the important leadership role they play in a big system like our NHS. 
then there are people who are particularly interested in training and they will adopt a, a different type of leadership role. There are those who are interested in quality who will adopt a different type. There are those um, who are interested in academia and will provide academic leadership. And then there is a small pr proportion of people who will want to take on a more formal management role. And then there are those who, who provide very powerful professional leadership in a kind of tribal way um, in, in a multi-tribe system such as the colleges uh, and specialist associations. And indeed, it was in this, um, this particular conference center that when I was a president of a specialist association, I warned that our specialty was sleepwalking into, into some dangerous territory. And actually, we, we run the risk as medical leaders of sleepwalking into, into letting our NHS decay um, in the face of economic adversity when actually that adversity should provide the fertile soil for us to seed new ideas for the way that we can develop our NHS. And I, we can explore that a bit later if, uh, if, if people would like. Um, I've heard a couple of remarks, firstly from um, the first speaker, medical student, who said, what about somebody publishing something on structure of the NHS? Well, I can undertake to do that in England. Um, some of the fellows on the, on the um, National Medical Directors Fellowship Scheme some years ago produced a document called the Junior Doctor's Guide to the NHS. And just when we were about to redo that, of course, the NHS um, was restructured and we didn't quite know what to write. But I think we know what to write now. So um, I Bri can... Briefly, perhaps. Yeah. Well, <laughs> um, and we will, we will publish something. So I give you an undertaking there. The other... The other issue that was raised was trying to get leadership into the medical curriculum. Well, I can certainly, certainly take that away and speak to the Council of Deans of Medical Schools and also to, to Medical Education England. I'll probably um, leave it there, Jill. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jill. Um, I think I should first of all say that uh, having worked in the NHS almost over my life, I love the NHS. Uh, and I think it's a great institution. Um, so I'm very proud of it, but I also recognise there are quite a lot of problems, and it was a matter of great interest to me to meet a colleague of mine. He was at medical school with me. He subsequently left, went to Northern Ireland, and then in, ended up in New Zealand. So I haven't seen him for 35 years. So when I s met him and uh, we both explain, exclaimed at how much, how little we'd changed in 35 years, um, I asked him what he thought of the NHS now that he'd come back to it. And his comment was quite thought-provoking. He said he thought that the system was uh, in meltdown. It was, in, it was broken. The system was broken. And he, he thought that all clinicians were probably enslaved in that system, which was a bit of a thought, really. So I suppose in any way you would expect to describe that as a crisis. Crisis is an interesting word, and I came across a definition of crisis when I went to Hong Kong recently for a joint meeting that we had. And the, one of the speakers said that in, in the uh, Chinese pictograms, crisis is formed of two words. One is danger, and the other is opportunity. So in reflecting on all of that and listening to what's been said today, it seems to me that there, there are a couple of needs. First of all is that we as clinicians in the NHS, at all stages of our career, need to develop our skills of leadership because leadership is important. And as one of our speakers said earlier, uh, it's leadership at all levels and in, in every part of the NHS. It's, not, it's even the porters, the nurses, the doctors, it's everyone. I think we all need to con consider developing our skills and, and it was, it's, it's really encouraging to see how that's going on here. I think the other thing is, that, which has also been alluded to, is the breaking down of hierarchies and this idea that we shouldn't be having a hierarchy of a consultant speaking down to a trainee. And I would rather refer to our colleagues in training rather than trainee do doctors or junior doctors in order to respect the idea that all of us are adults working together for a common cause, but there are different needs from each group. 
So it's an, that's the adult to adult relationship bit of it. I think also in terms of uh, the skills that we need to develop, it's this business of talking to each other wherever we are. And it's not just about talking in, a, in a, a meeting like this, because I suspect that we've all had a great time talking and great ideas have come up. But what is it that we are going to do individually when we get back to the places that we live and work in that is going to make a difference? Uh, and that's the challenge that I would put to you uh, from, from me as a college president. So that leads me on smoothly and seamlessly to colleges and what they can do. Um, and colleges are quite often re regarded as uh, organizations or systems that are uh, always behind the times. I would refute that from the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh because we have always been innovative uh, in our 500 year history. And I don't perceive that that's going to change any time soon. In other words, we are going to keep changing. I think that my responsibility as a college president is to encourage all our fellows and members to take uh, a very proactive view of leadership. Uh, and we've done this in the past with things like patient safety and, uh, uh, and various other things in terms of the examinations. But we need to encourage everybody to take a different approach to the way they work. And uh, one of the things that I feel most strongly about is that I have to uh, provide a bit of leadership to the fellowship and, and membership of our college to encourage them to get their, way, their, their nose up off the grindstone and to look ar around them at the problems that are facing them and to consider that they possibly, they definitely can do something to make a difference. Thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah, I have a few random reflections, not necessarily all that coherent, uh, both from the last two days and maybe you know, further afield. Um, I find myself here for the second year uh, doing what deputies do. Uh, and part of that is possibly because uh, certainly my boss sees the role of a leader essentially to make themselves redundant. So on the basis of my presence here today, he's uh, doing a fairly successful job. <laughs> but I think there, you know, there, there, there is a, you know, a subtle lesson there in that it is about uh, giving and sharing and bringing people on, uh, both those who are subordinate to you, as Jason said, those that work with you and those that work across this huge endeavour that we're involved in. Um, and some of, the, some of the things that struck me uh, over the last few days, uh, Chris Hamm in particular talking about uh, the Griffiths report and what it set out to do, which was about bolstering, engendering and developing medical leadership. But I suspect many of us in, in this room would, would have the perspective that it actually did the exact opposite, that it uh, used a term of, of shackling and, and, and hobbling medical leadership. And I'm quite sure that wasn't the original intention, but that uh, in many respects is as it has worked out, or even more importantly, as it has been perceived to, to, to work out. And, and part of that possibly is around the, uh, the tendency that, that we all have to uh, blame and blame other people. We blame the system, but ultimately the system we work in is uh, the cumulative endeavor of, in the case of Northern Ireland, some 60,000 people. And we have a key role in that we can either get engaged and engage in the system, which is imperfect, will always be imperfect, but through our endeavors can be better tomorrow than it is today and better again weeks from now than it is today. And in five years time, in 10 years time, utterly unrecognizable from what it is today because it will have to be uh, in order to uh, continue to fulfill what the public expect from us. And that brought me on to another reflection, and again, it's uh, related to our first two speakers. I have, a, I have a great deal of faith in our youth. I think it's uh, the old fogies, the predominantly male old fogies, who we need to do a job of work on uh, as part of our leadership role. Uh, I have one of my pleasurable tasks once a year, first Monday in August, 
every year, or certainly uh, since the Chief Medical Officer delegated it to me, in keeping with his, his leadership mantra. <laughs> I get to speak to uh, the whole foundation intake in Northern Ireland, all present in, in, in one room. And key to what I, I like to say to them is that you know, the public's expectation of them from day one is that they are acting in a leadership role. And I think for the most part they get that. Um, possibly they're untrammeled by the, uh, the system they're just about to get into. And I think there's a role for us in, in that regard as well in that it is an imperfect system. It's uh, always, as Nay Bevan alluded to, it will always be chasing after what the demands that are placed upon it are. Um, and we need to prepare ourselves and those doctors to work within that system, see it for what it is, don't, don't be delusional about it. Uh, that ultimately, I think, is, is, the, is the road to, to cynicism and the road to non-engagement. Uh, that through their endeavors, bit by bit, that it will be improved, it will meet the ongoing demands of, of society. And most importantly, I think, that they are equipped largely at the outset to deal with that, but as part and parcel of their ongoing development from day one, that they maintain, develop, and acquire attributes, skills, and behaviors that allow them to do that throughout their career. Thank you very much, Jill. I mean, like your boss, um, Paddy, my boss, I actually would love to be here. Uh, Ruth Hussey is CMO of Wales. You know, she, she would undoubtedly be here if she could be. As it, as it happens, she's uh, back at base, and um, she's landed one of my interviews this morning with the BBC, yet again, why Wales does not have and will not have a cancer drugs fund. Such is the trouble of uh, being a small neighbour to uh, NHS England. I think, but, uh, that's normally the interview I, I, I do. Um, co colleagues, um, colleagues in Wales uh, and the people of Wales are actually very proud of the NHS. They, they see it as a, a Welsh institution. And you'll all know it was established by a Welshman, you know, Naren Bevan, in 1948. And probably now it is the healthcare system that um, acts on values that still probably are closest to those original values. Um, our minister and the first minister last week at an international public health conference in Wales gave brilliant um, presentations about the value set of the Welsh NHS. And the points they made were that it was about um, uh, good government is good for people. Uh, it was about um, universalism, universal um, care and benefits when needed. It was about um, an equal society. And also, it was based on collaboration rather than competition. So we have a very different kind of value base in Wales. I think we've been, we're going through a year of transition. Um, we're not in any way immune at all to the uh, mid-staffs, France's issues. And we've been engaged in a lot of the fallout uh, following the various reports. And a lot of stones have been unturned. And we're now tackling a lot of difficult issues that I think have been there for some time. But I think as we do that, we're getting our systems in place, perhaps like colleagues uh, in, in elsewhere are as well. Um, we're tackling the difficult issue that we've got of um, our hospital configuration in what is, a, well, to some extent, a rural community. We have a lot of small DGHs. And so we know we cannot sustain the whole range of acute services in all these hospitals. And actually, we have embarked on this politically very sensitive issue, and there's now been public consultation about service change uh, in all parts of Wales. There have been referrals to the minister and scrutiny groups and ministerial um, uh, decisions. There's been um, review, a review of neonatal services that the first minister has called in, and he's shortly to uh, comment on. Um, and we can see that actually we've started this process of change and that actually um, the ball is rolling, and we can see that some of this consequential stuff is driving further change. So that's, I think, important for the future. Um, but I think we've also 
improved our systems in that quality and safety is the main game in town now. I think we've connected where it was necessary the quality monitoring function with the performance function. I think no longer can performance colleagues uh, decide on the performance of an organization without knowing of the quality issues. I think they are now all one system. Uh, so I think, that, I think that's, that's important. Um, we have some strength in Wales in the sense that we have quite a strong history around uh, a commitment to patient safety through our Thousand Lives campaign. And the Thousand Lives program that followed that has been trying to embed this patient safety ethos uh, into core business of all of our organizations. We're training a quarter of the workforce in improvement methodology at present by next March. That's quite a significant undertaking. That's 20,000 people uh, to us. Um, in relation to the undergraduate issue, also, we've had a very successful student chapter running following the Thousand Lives campaign. And actually, patient safety issues really seem to resonate with medical students. And actually, there's over 2,000 uh, members of that very active chapter, people very engaged in clinical quality and patient safety. I think a number of those are from outside Wales, but that's pretty positive. I think it's something else that we're doing, which I think is good, is that we recognize that if we're committed to excellence in research, education, and training, we'll get massive clinical benefits. And all of our health boards now are either university health boards or on a short path to becoming university health boards based on their close relationships with the university sector. And we're absolutely determined that that will make a difference, that actually those functions will be core business to all of our health boards and will insist that we drive out the clinical benefits that accrue from that. We've made a commitment that we will redu review all deaths in hospitals and we will evidence the learning and the change that occurs following that learning. So I think there are systems coming into place now which um, I think give us some cause for optimism looking forward. Uh, before I finish, I wonder whether I could just repeat how I see clinical leadership. I, I discussed this with a discussion group before. But for me, it's all about everybody having a sense of purpose when they come to work. It cannot just be enough to come to work, do your job, and go home again. Mm -hmm. but there's got to be something about everybody understanding what the future looks like, you know, what improvement would look like and what the path is to get there. And it worries me that there are so many clinical teams at present in, who, in, in which I can't see that collective, agreed, vision of the future. And of course, it has to be agreed and aligned with the managerial colleagues and the corporate aims. But I feel without that, um, we're going to have difficulty. So for me, the essential feature of leadership is creating that future. I think that makes all the problems that we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis easier to deal with because it gives us a framework to move forward. And I don't think it matters whether it's a doctor or a nurse or even a manager who, who, who leads, is whoever can, in a, in a way, engage to uh, create that vision. Um, but for me, that, that's a really important part of the organizational design of um, our provider and uh, organizations. Thank you. OK, Peter will feed in later. Um, just an observation, in the, that, that sort of um, session, we've really talked about one aspect of the faculty, which is the L word, the leadership word, which actually we're all much more comfortable about as doctors with the L word, because we're used to thinking about it. The M word is also important. Um, for me, good and effective management helps you become a good and effective clinician. Um, and for me, there are four levels. There's something about being able to manage yourself. It's the first thing we teach junior managers as well as junior doctors. If you can't turn up on time, you can't uh, you know, wear the right clothes or whatever, you have a problem in managing yourself and your patients. And we still know that we have clinical colleagues who cannot turn up to sessions on time and do not understand the management that goes behind that. The second thing that every doctor needs to be able to do um, is manage their own work. 
Um, I remember talking to a consultant who was newly appointed consultant, went to um, do her first clinic, and nobody had ever talked to her about what was the modern way of running outpatient clinics. So she did what everybody would do. She said to the sister, oh, what did my predecessor do? Her predecessor had been appointed in 1948, and as a brand new consultant, she was running a clinic based on the model of delivery that had been there without blood tests, without x-rays, without anything, all those things we've added in. So you have to be able to manage your work. The third thing you have to be able to do is manage in a team. And that's not just being about the leader of the team, it's knowing when to be the follower in the team, knowing when to play at different type roles within the team. And there are a lot of dysfunctional um, issues, and if you read the catalogue of disasters in the NHS, many of them have happened because every doctor in the team thought they were the leader and didn't work cooperatively and collegiately with other people for the benefit of the patient. And the fourth thing I believe you have to be able to do is understand the system you work in. Because if you don't understand the system, how do you ever change things for the benefit of your patients? And we have in many organizations, if you, and, and you look at the posters, they were very, very telling. People who don't understand how that system really works, what the rhythm of it is, and how to influence things. And if all you do is, is, is use the skills of shouting at people to try and get things better, no wonder you become frustrated and you become one of these cynics because actually you were never given the management set of skills to allow you to change things for patients. So don't forget the M. The L is important, but so is the M in what we need to do. And I suppose my other initial observation is maybe I got it wrong yesterday. It should be hug an old fogey rather than hug a surgeon. <laughs> Getting worse. This. <laughs> don't mind Rich, Rich, that still means you get a hug. <laughs> so, um, feeding and, and picking up the questions that have come out of the working groups, um, what, what did it really start about the evidence? Because one of the observations I think came out um, from the group, but it's also an observation I've had over the years, is how bad the NHS is at using evidence that comes from outside the NHS. We had a presentation yesterday from Richard Heron talking about BP, which actually a completely different industry, yet if you listen to it, it was, the evidence was exactly the same as we collect time and time again in the NHS, as if we're different. The other question that came out as part of that, and, and I want to get the panel to answer both bits of it, is what on earth are we doing with cross-country learning? We have this natural experiment of four different systems. We have political ambitions that go in different ways. But there are some immutable things which, if we don't collect and share across the four countries, we'll end up not reinventing the wheel and having um, uh, uh, episodes happen in one country which another country has got the solution. So the question really for the panel is, how do we get better and be a bit more humble, which is Michael West's word, about the evidence that's outside and how do we bring it in? And what are you going to do to share more effectively, particularly around patient safety? And I understand the challenge of that. So who wants to start? Ian. Well, I will start, first of all, by saying that a, the, the, the mantra that I have in my role as a president of the college is that whatever, whatever we do as a college has to have patient safety or the patient as the, the lodestone. Um, and then after that, whatever we do has got to support our fellows and members, and particularly those in training. Um, I think when it comes to evidence, you're quite right about the humility. We need to be humble enough to understand that other people have got some solutions, and we can learn from, from other people. But I think there's a vast amount of evidence within the NHS of things that have gone wrong uh, and the solutions that were put, been put in place to, um, to correct that thing that's gone wrong. Uh, and perhaps we don't um, tap into that enough, and we don't learn enough from that. Um, I think that's... Um, I'll stop at that point. Okay. Action. What are you going to do? What, what do I, what, what, what am I going to do? What college is going to do about it? Because well, this is about turning words into action. Yeah. Well, the thing I feel most strongly about this is that the action 
I have to do in terms of encouraging people to learn from these mistakes and using the evidence about leadership and management is to lead by example. Okay. And, I, I th and I think, although I can try and do that myself, I then have to encourage other people to do it. And I think that's the biggest thing, the biggest task for me. Okay, Jason. So we're, we're better at evidence than we used to be. In 1601, <laughs> a, a man discovered that if you gave sailors who were at sea for months lemons, they didn't get scurvy. He published that in the medical journal of the day, and the British fleet took 264 years to implement it. <laughs> so we're now down to 17 years. <coughs> Most, most evidence suggests that we implement 14% of the evidence in 17 years. So we should celebrate. In another 500 years, we might have that down to five. The, 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 there are two challenges with the evidence. One is the ability to look. It's actually easier for me sometimes to bring Bruce up to talk to Ward 5 than it is for Ward 4 to talk to Ward 5. You may be familiar with that scenario. So that's one thing. We're not good at local evidence. We also love to reinvent it. So the Welsh have eradicated pressure ulcers, pretty much. The Welsh are the, the best example across the four, K, four UK countries in pressure ulcer care. And, and yet we, we can't believe that that's possible in the other three countries. So we have to retest that method that the Welsh have done for us. Now, I could give examples in the other direction that the Welsh are not good at accepting from. from it's just, it's just one, one example. The four country leadership thing is, is the four country sharing thing is really interesting. The systems are, are now so diverse that at some level that, that learning has to change. We, we, we can't share as we used to share. It, it just doesn't work anymore because our systems are so entirely different. But inside that, some of the lessons around patient safety, some of the lessons of method. Some of the lessons I would, of course, say of the Scottish Patient Safety Programme, of the checklist implementation that's happened up here and other places, we can learn and does happen at CMO level, at clinical director level. It, it, we're not quite so good at doing it at hospital or GP practice level, at that more granular level. Okay. Chris? I mean, I, I think our systems are um, much more different, actually, than probably most people realise now. Um, but having said that, we, we do learn from each other. And if I could say Bruce's report, I mean, it was a superb report. I mean, and we learned a great deal from it. Although when asked, why don't you do KEO reviews, we say, well, no, we don't need to, because we've only got seven organisations, actually, and we're so close to them, they're almost in special measures anyway all the time. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, that's not a bad thing, that's just how it is, you know, just we, we know them very well. Um, that's a good discussion. Ha having said that, um, we, we, we are trying to, we, we are committed to the, the lessons from Bruce's report. Um, we, we, we have taken the message about a, a, a range of metrics and publishing metrics, and we've done that recently. Um, we also have taken the advice that you need to visit organisations and talk to people, and that needs to be a multidisciplinary activity, and you need to talk to everybody. So we're at the moment producing policy around visits to organisations, multi-agency visits as well. It, it isn't KEO reviews, that would be in some ways difficult, but, the, but we've learnt a great deal from the, the report which we're going to implement in our system. Okay. Bruce? Um, your, your opening bit was, why is the NHS so rubbish at learning from outside industries, such as BP and others? I think that's overstating it. I'm not sure I agree with you. So we get into the habit of talking about the NHS as though it was a single organization. It is not. It is a federal system of semi-autonomous, semi-competitive organizations that function in a system. And all of those semi-autonomous organizations, some of them very autonomous, actually have independent boards. And the more successful of those organizations have learned enormous amounts from outside the NHS. And indeed, they learn from other healthcare systems and other types of commercial organizations. And I think there is just this risk of thinking that the NHS is one organization. It isn't. 
<clears throat> and that kind of brings me to the next point, that having the NHS as a single organization or a top-down endeavor has got us so far, but it is not the route of travel for the future because what, what we've done over the years is we've constrained the innovative and creative potential of not just those organizations by telling them what to do and how to do it, but also of individuals working within those organizations. So as we start to lift the top-down directives away, it does create a problem because it's a bit like opening the door of a parrot's cage. You know, it takes a while before it comes out. And so we have to hold our nerve while we allow those organizations to flourish. And then I also find myself in a slightly contradictory way thinking of Jason's 17 years for innovations to take effect. So we know from, hard, from class one evidence that in all healthcare systems around the world, it takes about 17 years to, for something to become mainstream. And herein lies a massive opportunity for us because although we are a federal system of different organizations, we are closely connected. And I think there is a big opportunity for us, and this is a particular role, I think, for senior professionals in, in the system. We can concertina that time. Now, if we can concertina that time from 17 to five years through different mechanisms in Wales, different mechanisms in Scotland, through academic health science center, uh, networks in, in England, then, first of all, we bring more modern treatments to our patients more quickly. Secondly, we make it a more exciting place to work. And thirdly, we capitalize on, the, on the, the commercial potential, if you like, for our NHS, which is uh, healthcare is probably, or the life sciences industry are our second biggest industry in these islands. So there's a big opportunity for UK PLC and all of that. Um, the, and then the, the the next issue is that you raised about cross-boundary working. I think Jason's put it pretty well. We are all part of a, of a kind of multi-limb experimental study. And no matter how complacent we might like to feel in whatever country we're in, we're all the placebo limb in something that we do. <laughs> and we haven't been that good at really owning up to when we're the placebo limb. Um, or sharing when we have a good, have a good treatment. Um, I, I, I don't see an immediate solution, but I think the, the glue in all of this, or one of the glues, is medical leaders, because we see, or those treating patients, because I don't do that anymore, but those who do treat patients don't care which, where they come from or where they go to. And th those boundaries are invisible to professional organizations such as the colleges, the specialist associations, and the individuals who, who deliver the treatment. Can, can, I, can I just push you on that? Because these are questions that have been formulated in groups mm. who have been thinking about yeah. it. So there's a sense in the people who are part of that group that the evidence isn't there in a way that's helpful to them when they're going through training, when they're going through development. How do we make people feel? And, and, and if you're working in large numbers of these federal organizations mm -hmm. and you move between them and you're trying to bring some continuity and leadership, what can we practically do to help them? Accepting your analysis of what the world's like, what do we do and where does the help come from? Is that the faculty? Is it the college? Is it something that's done through the countries or actually with the recognition of the federal type of organization we are, that's no longer going to come from a central place? Um, it's quite a complicated question. So first of all, I think it'd be wrong for it to come from a central place. You know, we've tried that. Um, It needs to come from a multiplicity of places, and it needs to be, I think, generated from within the profession. So, you know, there's a whole science around organizational development. There's a whole science around leadership. There's a whole um, science around 
how you share information and how you accelerate change in large system, change in systems as opposed to organizations. And some of that can be done centrally, but we know that in a system, you get the, the most rapid uptake of change and the most sustainable buy-in from people in that system if you let them develop it themselves. So I think the faculty's got a major role in this. I think the colleges have got a major role. And I think health education England, in the case of England, has got a significant role. So de it depends what the, what the thing the is, is yes. you, you, you're, you're asking about. So one, one example in Scotland recently would be we have decided centrally in, in consultation with all of the workforce that we have 10 patient safety things that are now embedded in the system. The central line bundle, hand washing, safety briefings in wards, 10 things. And we've called them the patient safety essentials. They've been written by the Central Organization for Quality and Safety in Scotland. But in order to tell the workforce and aid the workforce in that implementation, we go to Ian and we say, your role in the Scottish context is to be supportive give us a quote, <coughs> sign up to the patient safety essentials, tell your fellows, not only your Scottish fellows, but as a learning exercise, tell your international fellows, this is what Scotland's doing. Ian says, strangely, yes, we will do that. He, he, he writes to all of his fellows, and it's a, jo it's a joined up patient safety essentials. That's evidence that's already gathered that is implemented that we are doing. It's a, it's a completely different thing to then say, here's an innovation, Here's a thing to do with education, different structures for that. But it, but it has to be using the mainstream infrastructures uh, and in our version of the NHS, there is more central control than there is in, in, in Bruce's. That, that wouldn't work in your world. That, that works in Scotland. It's not right or wrong, it's just different. So may I please, because I'd assumed you had talked about evidence around leadership. Uh, but evidence around it, But if, if I can come really. to, to Jason's yeah. point, I used the word tribalism earlier in my remarks. And I'll, I'll just talk about venous thromboembolism, which was tackled in a similar way when Neil Douglas was um, president of the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges. So our parliamentarians became anxious about the number of deaths from venous thromboembolism. And <clears throat> to cut a long story short, we, the Strategic Health Authority medical directors of <clears throat> which Peter was one at the time, we sat down, we thought, is there a case here for doing something? And the answer was yes. So we went to the college presidents and said, do you think there's a case? And everybody signed up to that. We then made it the number one clinical priority for, for the NHS. But, and we went, it was one of the, the most rapid change things that's happened in our NHS in 60 years. But the reason for that was, that everybody had a different role. So the colleges spoke to their members, their tribes, to say this is a good thing to do. And it was the job of likes of me to go and put financial levers, uh, incentives and penalties into the system. And a combination of both of those created massive change in 18 months. So we went from about 25% of people being assessed for venous thromboembolism um, to well over 90% in 18 months. But I, I will leave, we leave that question because I think what's really important is very complicated for Peter because he's not been allowed to say anything yet. <coughs> um, yeah, just very quickly, because I took this to be the evidence around leadership. I mean, the yeah. first thing is, I mean, Michael West described yesterday, yeah. and the reason we asked Michael West was that I think that a lot of the stuff that he talks about is not well known in the system. And the, and the fundamental point about that is that if you take just one piece of that, that team working, good team working in organisations reduces more mortality. And that's, that's an important thing in itself, but uh, it starts to say to people that actually leadership, team working, and all these things that do not have the, the appropriate res respectability in our system at the moment are <coughs> every bit as important as being great clinicians. We're doing a piece of work now with Michael West to garner all that information and bring it into one place, jointly with the King's Fund, jointly with the Centre for Creative Leadership. So that's one thing that we're doing. I think the second thing is, is that as an ologist, I knew where to go and find um, the latest tome on pituitary surgery. In fact, I took the journal that, that, that told me where that was. As a leader, as I alluded to yesterday, 
it was really difficult for me to know where did I actually go and find the literature around this. So what we're trying to do again, and Kirsten's leading on this piece of work, is to bring together the 3,000 online journals that you all have access to, uh, which many of you probably didn't realise you did free gratis <laughs> through membership of the faculty, and start to garner that information, bring it together so that... Because actually 3,000 journals sounds great, except you know, to just go and say, well, go and read these 3,000 journals isn't terribly helpful. So what we're trying to do is for all the different roles and the different responsibilities people have to bring the appropriate information together around that. Um, and we've, we've started on that journey. We'd like to accelerate it. Um, but uh, time, And can I just make one point about the Four Nations thing? Because there's a point that hasn't come out. And I, I think we should rejoice the fact there are four different ways of doing things. I think we should learn from each other rather than having to disagree across the Atlantic to learn how to do things. And I hope governments will take that. But I think we've got a responsibility and an opportunity in the trainee community. Because the first thing is, I pray that all this talk of devolution and, and whatever doesn't mean that actually we then become totally insular so English trainees don't go to Scotland and Scottish trainees don't go to Wales, et cetera, et cetera. If we accept that, then we have to make sure that the trainees are literate in the systems that they're going to be moving into. Indeed. So I think we've got some significant responsibility for that. And I think the clinical fellows, actually, now that all uh, three of the four nations have got clinical fellows, and we're hoping that Ireland will follow suit fairly soon. We've certainly been browbeating them for long enough. Um, but actually, I think that's a great opportunity to start to do some of that comparator work and, and, and learning. OK. If we can just change direction slightly, but there is a theme here. Um, one of the groups was talking about they're tired of talk about culture change. And it, for me, it was really about how do we move from all this aspiration into making this real? And I suppose the question that, that I have as an observer is to make this happen, there's a, a, an enormous amount doctors can do themselves, leading within the profession, uh, convincing their colleagues that all of this sort of stuff is really important. But to make it really bite, it's got to be a whole organization, which means engaging with other professions and engaging with managers. And I suppose the question is, what do we do now? You know, you're at the cusp of uh, a, a movement, a set of activity, real enthusiasm. How do we make sure this is not a false dawn? What are we practically going to do to turn that corner? And maybe, Paddy, because you didn't comment on the last mm. one, I could get you to start. Um, and I think the first answer is have two clinical fellows. Well, in all <laughs> truth, we, ha we have one and have had one for many years and everything, but Niam uh, and both the current one and uh, the previous uh, person that did the role have been at this conference this year and indeed in, in the case of the earlier one in last year's conference and indeed uh, one going back a years now in, in their consultant role in a significant leadership role in our largest trust. So without having badged them as, as clinical fellows, they are discharging the role and indeed discharging it at a level of senior, seniority, i.e. well into their specialist training years where they get the most out of it in our view and indeed put the most, the most back in simply because what they've acquired through 78 years of, of clinical practice. Um, so we'll, we'll work at the mechanics and the, and the niceties and the politics of uh, uh, rebadging them as clinical fellows, but it, it's not as though we haven't been in that game. Okay. So On the question of how culture, make it bite, yeah. make it real. Yeah. Yeah. Increasingly, the, the thing about culture with me, it, it, it's in danger of becoming one of those hackneyed terms that gets thrown out every now and again and meaning different things to, to different people. Uh, a bit in a way that quality was five, six years ago, and now there, there is fairly common uh, understanding of, of what quality entails, the three elements, safety, effectiveness, and good professional experience. And you know, we, we maybe need to, uh, to develop something around that, or possibly, as I've reflected on over the last few days, just put culture back in the peppery dish where it belongs uh, and go on about, ultimately, it's, if it is about this is how things are done around here. It's about ensuring how things are done around here. And you know, that's important at government level. Ultimately, you know, one of the lessons from mid-staffs, uh, us reflecting on it from, from the sideline, was 
inadvertently had the you know, government through more through what it didn't say rather than what it did say, said that foundation trust status is the only show in town and everything else is subsidiary. I'm quite sure that that was not the intention, but sometimes by act or omission, we find ourselves in very paradoxical and very unwanted, unwanted places. Um, so if it is th about saying what's important, it's about being explicit about what's important and that that channels all the way through the system because ultimately it doesn't, doesn't matter a damn if it doesn't ultimately impact on the interaction between individual clinical teams and individual patients or in the case of Northern Ireland patients and users of social care. Uh, and it's, it, it's about developing a common understanding of, of, of what that is. So Jason, how do we make it real? So Chris, when he does a survey in 10 years, says medical leadership succeeded. So I, I'm a bit conferenced out this week, so I'm gonna be a bit brash. Please. It, it, you may not be surprised to hear some of you in the crowd. I think a lot of the culture talk is hogwash. I think culture comes from task. I have a bias that says, Culture can only be changed through different actions and behaviours. And this room have to act and behave differently in order for the culture to change. You don't navel gaze your way into culture change, you act your way into culture change. So there are, we, we could all write a list of 40 things. Let me give you two things you could do this week. If you're a junior doctor, a consultant, a trainee, I could take you to a hospital in this city that has introduced an eight o'clock huddle in the, in the morning, of course, an eight o'clock huddle that talks about safety and flow in that hospital. It's completely revolutionary. It brings together all the senior charge nurses, all the senior leaders, and the managers in one room standing up for 10 minutes every morning. It was started by a consultant who had been in the job less than a year. She just did it. She didn't seek permission. She just went round her pals. And they started to do it just in acute medicine because that's where she works. And then she started to spread it. And now it's astonishing. It's completely revolutionized the way that hospital does its work. So you could start a safety and flow huddle wherever you are, if you're in a GP practice, if you're a clinical director of a whole system. The second thing you could do is start to do something revolutionary with patients. Just include them. Just start conversations with patients and families in a completely new way. So I don't mean the patient in front of you, I mean patients and families at scale. Just completely change the conversation. And if you start to advocate for that, you'll start to find the world changes. It just opens up. You can't talk about consultant car parking when the patient advocates are in the room. It just, it just won't happen. So it'll just completely change the way you have the conversation. <coughs> and I could take you to places in Scotland where that's real and, and where it hasn't even begun. I'm following Twitter on the stage. That's why I'm looking at my phone. Audrey Burt is in this room. Audrey Burt is one of Scotland's greatest patient advocates. She could tell you now, before you leave, how, how, how to do that. And it will completely change the way you deliver your healthcare. Okay, so do it, is your message, Ian. Well, I was just gonna follow on from what Jason has said. You know, it's a bit like, how does, how does the flu spread? It's um, oral transmission. <laughs> so why don't you all go and talk about it? And talking is probably the first stage, but then you have to go on to what Jason is doing, which is acting. Um, and uh, I think if you talk about it, then you're more likely to be able to recruit people that will help you to do it. Indeed. And I do absolutely believe that you have to act and, and you know, somebody's got to start it somewhere. Um, so uh, let's go and start a, a, a viral uh, infection. Peter. Uh, well, I'm not going to be very original either because I absolutely agree with Jason. I think what you're describing, I, I do a lot of work with, with, uh, with trainees. And one of the, when I talk about this, they say, well, what can I do? I'm just a small fish in the pond. And I can say, well, you've got people who are junior to you. And it's how you treat them is, and it's interesting, because I think what Jason's describing is that you do that. And interestingly, uh, and they like it, and over time, and the, there is an issue about time here, because you have to have the courage to keep this up for a while, because people will think you're soppy and all sorts of stupid, uh, other stupid expressions. But then other people start to copy you of your peer group. And then what starts to happen, interestingly, is that the group above you start to copy you as well. So I would absolutely endorse that. And everybody in this room, as Jason said, can go and do that tomorrow. I found working with managers when I was a director of public health, there was one question that unlocked it. How can I help you? Because if you can help, do something. 
and it's always a surprise. Managers are equally care, concerned about patient care and good patient outcomes. Just get the agenda aligned. And how often do we ask, how do I help you? you know, we tell them all the things that are wrong, but if we only helped because of the vision, the excitement, the enthusiasm, the understanding in the room, you can move the mountains. I think that's the message. When I was a, when I was a fellow at IHI in Boston, it, as you, when you leave, Don Berwick was the chief executive, and he takes each fellow for dinner and he gives them advice. So he, first of all, he tells you how great you are because he's a nice guy, and then he brings dessert, and you think, OK, now I'm going to get it. <laughs> and he, his, his single piece of advice was go and effing improve something. Yeah, exactly. That was his advice. He okay. said, just go and find something to change. OK, so I think that's a beautiful place to end the culture question. <laughs> OK, so you know the message. The Jean-Luc Picard, make it so. Star Trek for those of you who are not cultured. Um, <laughs> and then I want to finish with two, two questions, really, which were closely interlinked. One is about if the agenda means more strategic alliances, if the agenda is around getting more doctors, more managers, everybody is part of this movement to make sure the clinical leadership really bites to help improve patient care, because that's what it's about. It's not about anything else. What does the faculty need to do to strengthen itself, to lead in this sort of conversation? And I suppose, following on from Jason, what can we do to help the faculty? And as you've got them, what can they do to help the faculty? You're asking me? Yeah. I say I hope so. Because <laughs> if they commit themselves, we'll have it on tape. Well, I think, I mean, the fact that they're all sitting on this panel, and, uh, and apologies that they're all men, but I couldn't do anything about that, um, <laughs> is, is number one. I mean, I think to have people of this level of seniority backing an organization uh, is number one. I think number two has been mentioned already. We are owned by all the Royal Colleges. So I think to have the colleges, meant, because as Bruce talked about with the VTE example, uh, it would have been very difficult to do that as just the operational medical leadership management arm uh, on its own. It took the, the, the college arm, so I think there's a lot there to do. Um, and I've lost my thread now, but uh, I do that fairly regularly. Uh, if anybody's, as I said on Monday, got to spare a million in their pocket, that would be, that would be really helpful. I think we need to do some... Uh, some stuff uh, as well as as individuals uh, and I think you you keep nagging at me and saying well we're only a medical uh, group and that was that was the remit that was what we were charged to do and I think you'll all agree that there's an awful lot to be done around medical leadership and within medical leadership I would just cite the relationships between primary and secondary care in many instances the, there are real serious issues that we need to get right so that we're speaking with a unified voice but I do think we need fairly soon, and I don't know how soon fairly soon is, to start engaging with other groups. We have had conversations with the scientists. We have had conversations with the nurses. Um, that was not a conversation about taking over and being the overarching body which we would inflict on them because I think that would be doomed to failure. Equally, I think if we tried to set up a joint organization, we'd still be arguing about how many tables there are uh, uh, seats there are around the table rather than 700 people coming to a conference two years in a row and 2,000 members. Um, so I think, we need to, I think we need to have partner organizations where we share and we work very closely together. And I would love this to be a confederation of, of, of different professional groups sitting in, in this room in, in years to come. And the final piece is, is, is maybe one of the easier ones, but I think we do need to start, how do we make bridges across to the, to the management fraternity? Because I think one of the most deeply dysfunctional relationships that I see is the relationship between clinicians and managers. And I am absolutely on the same page as you. I have worked with managers all my career. I believe their value sets are absolutely identical to ours. It's just they don't get the boxes of chocolates at Christmas. Uh, so I think we need to start to think about ways of how we start to engage in those groups. But I will go back to what I said right at the beginning. There is so much to be done around medical leadership that I don't want to see that diluted, laudable, all those uh, other things are. Yeah. Okay. Chris. I mean, I, I completely agree with what you just said about um, the relationship with managers. I mean, the, the, the most effective clinical leadership that I've ever seen or experienced has been when a clinician and a manager are working together. I mean, it's really powerful. 
and I'm concerned that there's a kind of standoff in quite a lot, you know, a lot of the NHS. <coughs> you can sort of understand it because if clinicians haven't necessarily led, then the managers have to do their best. And of course, they don't do a brilliant job of it because they don't understand the services as well as the clinicians, and so the clinicians then get disengaged. That there has to be a coming together of that as quickly as we can, and I think that's an OD type issue to some extent. I think there's organisational development, and I wonder whether the faculty could help a little bit um, with that because I'm not entirely convinced. Although we have a director of workforce and OD on each of our boards, I'm not certain every organisation understands how it needs to set itself up to facilitate these relationships. So I think, I think that would be helpful. And I think some kind of coming together with the IHM or something like that would be very helpful too, create some new conversations. And the faculty needs to work with each of the countries. And we've got quite a lot of work to do with our clinical leadership structures. We've got a workshop in December on our leadership training. Is it coherent? Does it meet our needs? The faculty can bring a lot of experience and knowledge to help us with that. Yeah. Maybe a good start would be this issue that Chris addressed yesterday a joint statement from the faculty and a management group about what a good job description for a clinical director and a medical director looks like. When you have medical directors given one session a week to manage 20 million pounds business, it's not gonna do the thing. That can only be achieved by a strategic alliance. It's not merger, it's strategic alliance. And now's the time with the power of the people you've got here to be a bit assertive, I think, in that. What, one of the challenges is there isn't a single management organisation, because the NHS Confederation, massive organisation, I spoke at their annual conference last year, but that's predominantly England. The IHM, I think, goes has a bigger spread. We've had a conversation with them, but they're in a state of enormous flux at the moment. Yeah, we, uh, we can find, I, I can think of ways we can do that, and using the brokerage of people around here is having the face-to-face -face conversation about what it looks like, and, and I, I'm sure we can do that, because it's one of the enablers to allow people to meet their aspiration. Then the final question, and it leads on neatly from that, was about career structures. Uh, you know, what a lot of young people, they're really excited by all the opportunities, yet you hear stories that they do uh, fantastic change programs uh, where they're developing management and leadership skills as well as improving things for patients. And then they go into the system and no one recognizes it as important work. What are we going to do to change that and where does that get led? Maybe I could ask you, Ian, to start that and then Bruce. Yes, I think the, um, from a college's point of view, it's, it's a bit difficult to do anything other than try and change people's understanding about the importance of management. And I suppose that's where I think that colleges can work with the Faculty of Medical Leadership and Management uh, in joint ways. Perhaps it's to do with courses that might be broadly put down as uh, new consultant induction courses, that kind of thing, which keep, keep people uh, at the forefront of understanding about how the management and leadership and their, their professional skills must go hand in hand uh, and try and get people away from this idea that when they've got a, a CCT or CST as it may well be in the future, that the only thing that's important is their clinical skills. We must induce in people the understanding that it's a lot more than that and uh, the, the leadership role of consultant practice is considerable, but also to get uh, people at all levels of training to understand their importance in clinical leadership. Okay. Do you want to add anything, Bruce? Then I'll give the final word to Peter. No, it's really complicated and worries me. So, I must say I've never achieved anything w without working closely with a professional manager. Um, we're trained as doctors, we're trained in the life sciences, medical science, they are trained in the science and practice of management, equal professionals. And as a fighting pair, you can achieve quite a lot. The question is, when's the best time to do that? And I think it comes down to the younger generation. It's a bit like the Jesuits say, show, give me the boy and I'll show you the man. So if we, can, if we can think of some way of linking, I think, the clinical fellows with the fast streamers going through the NHS training, sc training stream. I think that would be a very major step forward. I think there's also something about linking um, the Leadership Academy. I'm talking about England now, but the, the Leadership Academy and this, because 
they have slightly different ways of doing things, slightly different constituencies, but I think there could be a very powerful, a very powerful synergy. And then the final thing that's worrying me a lot at the moment, and I don't see an immediate solution, um, is that the fellows come back to me and they say, we go back and the consultant says, well, now the jolly's over, let's have a, you know, now you can get on with some proper work. And actually, I think that's slightly insulting, if not very insulting, for people who are the next generation of leaders who will determine policy direction of travel for our NHS. Um, and there may be something the faculty can do uh, here in terms of support for, um, for, the, for the junior doctors. I, I'm, I don't know the answer, Peter. Peter. I mean, I, I agree with what Bruce has just said. I get incensed by yeah. the stupid behavior of some of our peers and the out. way that they treat trainees when they go back having done what is an amazing year. And actually having, as Lola said, doesn't count. This is an extra year that they've taken out. Um, what I want to see, and I think, uh, I think it's been talked about a number of times, is a three-level system. So mm -hmm. there's a minimum level that all trainees get, but at the top level we have a fast-track system where their clinical training, like I understand academic clinical fellow training to be, their clinical training is subservient to their management and leadership journey. I think it needs the backing of all of us in this room. But I, think, I, don't think, I think the postgraduate deans will absolutely support this. Well, I've spoken to most of them and I think they will. Can I just say one last thing on the career structure thing? Because I'm slightly anxious that we have a very privileged life to some extent in medicine, that you know, you're a houseman or whatever we call them these days, and an SHO, and on and on, on you go. I don't think that happens outside. I think that we have a responsibility to equip people with the skills to go to the next job. And I think we have the responsibility to tell them what that wonderful array of other jobs are that they, that they could be doing. I don't think we can. We step onto a ladder and we have a right to say, well, okay, I've done a clinical fellowship, therefore I'm going to be Bruce in 20 years' time. Um, I, don't, I don't think it should work like that. Okay, and Ian? Um, uh, well, I'm at risk here of um, making a statement that um, my fellow presidents would not uh, approve of, but I, th I think there's a, a real power in including in college systems this, um, these fellowships. And maybe there should be more collaboration instead of with governments, Jason and Keith. Um, there should be um, there should be more discussion with the colleges about uh, having fellowships, which would then bring this into what perhaps the the older generation of colleges feel is is important. Okay. There so are, some there are some, there are some but yeah. not enough. Yeah. But but the sense coming from uh, you know the groups is now is the time to be laying out some of these complexities and some solutions, and together with how on earth do we make sure the managers are on our side because you need them to create the jobs that actually give people the opportunities seems to me to set a really vibrant agenda for the faculty, the colleges, and the leaders of the medical profession over the next couple of years. So um, next year, it'll be bring a manager and hug an old fogey. And a patient. And a patient, if or we're ready for that as well. So that would be a really exciting conference. So no more ado. I'll say thank you on your behalf uh, to our panel, who I think have tried to wrestle with some really complex issues. None of these things are simple. And thank you all very much.